So as I said, uh, Ben's from Australia. Um, he's been here in the States. Uh, he came to Corning to teach a course last week. He's been our guest artist here in the amphitheater this week. And uh, tomorrow he's heading back to his family. Um, but it's been great to have him here. Um, Ben's uh, an excellent glassmaker. He's been at this a good long time. Um, and for me personally, it's great to have Ben back in the shop. Um, actually, the first time I, I ever came to Corning, New York from Ohio was to take a class with Ben back in 1996. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's good to have him back here in Corning. And um, you know, certainly it's, uh, I've grown a lot from learning techniques that he's shared, and it's uh, good to have him back here sharing some, some new stuff that he's been working on. Um, ben is known for collaborative work with his wife, Kathy Elliott, and uh, a lot of the objects that you see up here are similar to what they make uh, collaboratively, um, but Kathy will take these pieces, or similar pieces similar to these, and do some contemporary engraving work on the surface, put textures and things in the surface of the objects to sort of enhance, more recently, to enhance uh, the, the motion of the color going through an object like this. There's a swath of, of cane work going through this, and Kathy will engrave the surface of these to enhance that. Um, so a little later on in the demo here, we actually have some slides we'll throw up on the screen for everybody to get a look at. Um, what that collaborative work is like. How many of you have seen glass making here before? Just about anybody? We've seen a lot of glass making. This looks familiar then, right? This is the way we start almost anything we do here. Um, if it's going to be a wine glass or a simple pitcher or one of these beautiful sculptural vessels, uh, it all starts with a nice little gather of glass out of the furnace. There were some pre-made elements um, that um, Ben has prepared to speed the process along. And, and actually, not just that. Even if um, he weren't making these in front of an audience, he would pre-make these other elements um, just to make sure that he had what he needed when he needed it. Um, and they're going to be actually the some of the, the, um, the decorative cane work that you see um, woven across the surface of this vessel. So George over there right now is actually, I think, picking up. Is that a solid chunk, George? Yeah, a, a big solid chunk of, uh, of some pre-made, uh, a, a pre-made chunk of uh, glass with cane on the surface. And so he'll use that, get it nice and hot, and then actually be able to draw it over the surface of the vessel to get that nice fine line pattern. Here's a, a little chunk of that color that he has right here that we use for another vessel. So George is heating those up in the garage here. We had it warmed up to about 1,000 degrees in an electric pickup oven. Uh, he's then heating it up a little bit more in the garage here. This is a gas garage with a burner over on this side. So you can hold that glass in that burner and make sure it's just starting to soften so that when you put it into the 2,000 degree reheating furnace, it doesn't blow up, which is what George is heading over to do right now. So Ben's just setting up his bubble. Um, to make a larger vessel, you need to gather more glass, layers and layers of crystal clear glass out of the furnace. We all know the glass in the furnace at 2,100 degrees is the consistency of, of honey. It's a thick liquid. <clears throat> and so to make something larger, you have to build it up in layer upon layer. Uh, so Ben's made two gathers of glass. He'll probably make a couple more before they start applying some color. <clears throat> Sounds like we have Zydeco in the house tonight. The, the band in the auditorium is playing in here. <coughs> we keep it a little bit low so that you guys can be part of the uh, experience here. Um, but it's good to get a little taste of what's happening over there. And if you want to hear it up a little louder, you, you're welcome to head on over to the auditorium and check that out. I think we're only making one vessel tonight. So, you know, this is a two-hour event. Um, this lasts until 8 o'clock. And uh, I think when they made, made these other ones, Ben was saying they took about, about two hours, so 
Uh, this is going to be a one-piece night. That's right, isn't it, Chris? Or we just weren't making the one vessel this evening? Seems like a long time, maybe, to take two hours to make a vase like this, to make a, a sculptural vessel. Um, but, you know, then you think about it. What, a, what other material can you work with where you start from nothing and in two hours you have this amazing, beautiful vase? I mean, glass is, is an incredible material. So Ben's just letting that cool off a little bit. He's letting that core set up so he can gather on top of it. Head back over to the furnace there. I have a thousand pounds of molten glass in that furnace. You dip the pipe down in there, turn it around, and spool more of that material on the end there. Any chance are up in the booth? Can we play the gathering animation, the gathering video? This is something we do during our demos during the day. I don't know if we have it queued up tonight because of the special demo. <coughs> I love seeing a beautiful gather like that. The more, the more you blow glass, the longer you do this, the more you realize that really the success of the piece um, is kind of, it's kind of make it or break it when you go up to that furnace and make a gather. Ben pulls out a beautiful gather of glass. It's really nice and even in shape. And it's even <coughs> in temperature as well. You can tell because it's all just sort of glowing a uniform orange color. There's not a lighter or dark spot on one side or the other. And really, setting up this core with those nice even gathers makes the rest of your job so much easier. He's tightening the glass up on the, on the pipe there just to set everything up just the way he wants it to make sure that it all, all goes smoothly from here. <coughs> A little more work with that wooden scoop. You can see the steam wafting off of it there. The other fun thing about watching Ben work here, he's, he's, uh, he's not overdoing it, right? You know, there are some, some glass makers who go through, the, go through the motions just because they've seen somebody do it. They, they, they maybe are just doing things because they see other people doing it, not because they're actually accomplishing anything. And it's fun to watch Ben because sometimes he'll just stand back and wait for the glass to catch up or wait, wait for things to even out. Um, really not touching it, but still accomplishing something, still um, being purposeful about it. <coughs> and again, this is just a matter of building up that foundation for the, for the piece you're working on. Certainly want to say hello to all everybody watching out on our, our live stream. It's always great to know, you know, here in the audience we have 100 people sitting and watching us, but hopefully we have at least that many watching us online. Uh, it's, it's a great way that the museum has, has uh, been able to broaden the, the, uh, the reach of, of what we do here in this shop. There are a lot of, a lot of glass makers across the country and around the world that, um, that love to see somebody like this work. Um, you know, see somebody who's been doing this a long time and has a uh, beautiful, distinct style. And it's really nice with the uh, live streaming now to be able to reach that community and to, to share what we're doing here in the shop. How's it going on li online, Amanda? Any, uh, 55, people. 55 people watching. Excellent. That's a good start. Yeah. Geo Studios watching. Great. Bubble within a bubble. Nope, it's just a bubble. <laughs> Now, Ben actually said that his family uh, was going to be watching in Australia, too. So hopefully they tune in as w Kathy can check up on him and make sure he's working hard. Ben has two daughters, 
Over in Australia, anybody know what time of day it is over there? About 9 in the morning. Megan knows. About 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Saturday morning. Wait. Friday morning. Yeah, I was going to say, it's Thursday here. Yeah. So this is this is not reticello tonight. This is just cane patterning on the surface of, of the vessel here that, that Ben is doing. Yeah, so we've got some people watching tomorrow. <laughs> I think we're a little more familiar with that now, right? Because the Olympics are happening, right? And they're just waking up and starting some more of the Olympic competition over there in South Korea. Have a great team working working with Ben tonight. Um, Jeff Mack right now is working the pipe, turning. Uh, Chris Rochelle is at the furnace, uh, heating up one of those cane elements. George Kennard is heating up one of the cane elements. Helen Tegler is helping out. Uh, my name is Eric Meek. Um, and we all work as glass artists here at the, the Corning Museum of Glass. All right, so Ben is talking with uh, Jeff here how much heat to put into that, what he's hoping to accomplish. Uh, ben was just saying he wants to blow the bubble through the end a little bit. Yeah, he's using a newspaper right now to form the glass. Jeff's capping the pipe. Uh, and Helen's working the shield just to uh, block some of the heat from Ben's arm there as they're working. <laughs> if you're looking up on the monitor right now, you can just see that bubble. It's trying to work its way down to the tip a little bit. Ben was holding the paper on the side. The, the bubble's traveling down to the end a little bit, the part farthest away from the pipe. It's taken Jeff and, I'm sorry, George and Chris a little while to heat up these cane, uh, cane setups that they're gonna be applying to this. They're pretty solid glass and they were down around 1,000 degrees. Glass is actually an excellent insulator, so if you have a piece of glass and it's 1,000 degrees, to get the whole thing up to 2,000 degrees, all the way down to the core, it takes a long time. You can't just stick it in the furnace and stand there and wait because the surface will get really hot and the core stays really cold. So it takes a while of repeated heating and rolling it on the table here. You, you get it nice and hot, you marver it to retain the shape, to chill the surface a little bit, heat it up again to really drive that heat down into the core. Uh, but they're getting close now, close to the point where they'll be applying the cane decoration to the surface of the setup that Ben has established so far. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Before the demo tonight, we were having an interesting discussion about technique and the way that technique has evolved. Now, in 1996, I came to the studio here and I took a class with Ben. Uh, ben learned quite a lot of what he knows from a glassmaker named Lino. Has anybody seen Lino Taliapietro work? He's been here a couple of times. Um, Lino has really influenced the way that glass artists in the United States work. And there's kind of a period before Lino and after Lino. So when Lino first started coming to the States in the late 80s, um, glass artists in the United States were kind of figuring things out for themselves and they were working in a, in a lot of varied and uh, archaic ways, but Lino really helped to influence the way that people work and uh, certainly has been a heavy influence on Ben. So applying cane, like he's doing right now, Applying cane is definitely a, uh, an Italian-derived technique, but the way he's doing it is certainly 
certainly unique and certainly his own. So it's been great to watch um, artists take a lot of the techniques they've learned from Italian masters like Lino and uh, put their own contemporary spin on it. Um, but when we were talking before the demo tonight, we were saying it's been since the late 80s kind of that Lino came and changed the way people started to work. And um, I sort of referred to the way that people in the United States work today as an, an Italian influenced style. And Ben was saying, you know what? It's been long enough, I think we can just call this a studio glass style, just what it's evolved into. And it's really a, a, an amalgamation of an Italian influence and a, the way a lot of studio artists work in the States and influences from other countries. We just had a Swedish glass artist here and there are things that we do that are influenced by Swedish glass artists. Um, some Australian things. So it's really, um, I think, evolved into a, a fantastic technique that, that, that we can really call a studio, the studio style now. All right, so Chris is applying a little bit. There, you can just catch it on the, on the screen. He's just applied a little bit of gold leaf. So remember, underneath that gold leaf is clear glass coated with lots of really fine white lines called cane. And so they're wrapping that around. And look at that cane wrap pull off nice and evenly around the, uh, the circumference of that bubble. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun right now to, to be able to, for, for folks here in the audience, to be able to look at an object like this. Remember, when we got started, we're saying, this is what we're shooting for, right? And so you know where we're heading, and you take a look at what we're doing right now, and get a little bit of an idea of how, how that pattern is achieved. Hey, you want to you wanna get a shot of this when they reheat, so the folks looking online can see what Ben's shooting for as well. You can see they're applying those cane stripe patterns right now. So there, they got another one going on. Looking good. So the, the parts that he applied were the, the white lines in there. You can see this one has some dots on it. The dots will be coming next. Ben, do you have a, a name for this color technique? Uh, not really. Not really? No, I was thinking, yeah. We were kicking around some ideas today. Pushing some, around some ideas for this color application techniques. What's that? Slalom, there we go. That's a good one. Very appropriate. We're about to put the gates in. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So again, if you look at the, the vessel in the front of the stage there, you can see that those patches of color are kind of interspersed between the lines of cane. So the next step will be to, to create some space for those patches of color and then to drop the color in there. Helen, what color are we using? Uh, it's a red. A red. red. New red? Yeah, it's an opaque red. I don't remember which one we had settled on. Do you know what this is, George? New red, okay. Anybody have any questions so far? It's one thing I forgot to say in the beginning. If you have any questions, this is uh, completely casual. Feel free to yell at us. When he was applying, hmm, I, I, so, oh yeah, so he was, he was turning the pipe underneath it. Yeah, so rolling the pipe into that. It's like wrapping, well there he's doing it again. You can see it's like wrapping bubble gum, uh, you know, around a toilet paper tube or something. You just touch it on there, it sticks and turn it around and it spools right around there.
Now, the difficulty in making doing something like this then is, you know, that's a lot of relief. Ben, do you gather over these? Yes, that's what we gather over. Yeah. So that's a lot of relief. Um, so he's going to have to work those wraps in so it's smooth on the surface after he's applied the dots of new red glass in between to make that perfectly smooth again so that when it's gathered on top of, uh, it doesn't trap any air uh, in all that texture. So you, it's going to take quite a while just to get that texture worked out of there after we get all the color applied. So again, it's really important uh, when you're making something like this, you know, something that could wind up in a gallery, um, to take your time to do every step along the way um, with a lot of care and attention. So that on your final gather, you don't get a big, you don't gather up a big blister in there, a big bubble or something that that would uh, that would not be not be that pleasing to see in the final final vessel. The other thing, like I said, um, is a lot of the objects that Ben makes. His his wife Kathy then f works further, and she'll work hours and hours. It takes Ben two hours to make these, but then Kathy will take it and spend I don't know. 20 hours on it, engraving and carving patterns into the surface to enhance his color decoration. Um, so it makes it all the, all the more important to, to take care in every step as you're going on here to make sure everything is coming out just right. Again, creating space there, pushing that wrap around a little bit so it's just not right around the circumference of it, but so it has a little bit of motion in there. It's been a great winter. We were just talking about that too before the show here in the in the amphitheater. Um, you know, in the summertime, we're really cranking away in here. We have lots of guests uh, filling the museum. Uh, in the off season, it's a little more quiet in here, and we have guest artists come. Uh, so, you know, this winter we've had Robin and Julia Rogers. They did 2300 last month. Did, was anybody here for that 2300? That was a fun piece, wasn't it? Yeah, it's fun to, to have a diverse range of uh, artists come through here. Um, we had Jim Mongrain here earlier in the season. Now Ben is here. Next 2300 is going to be great, right before St. Paddy's Day, I think. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe even on St. Paddy's Day this year. I have the Red Hot Chili Pipers coming back, and we have a, a team here from Corning. Dane and Megan, are they in the house? Dane and Megan, wave your hands. They're going to be heading up. There you go, the next 2300. So come back and check out what they have in store for a special St. Paddy's Day 2300. We have an artist, uh, Dan Friday, coming out from the Pacific Northwest. Dan's a, a glass maker from, from Seattle, and he'll be coming in April. Now, he's not doing a 2300, but if you have a chance, you want to come and check out the work that Dan makes. He does some really beautiful, inspired work with a lot of. Um, a lot of figures in it, it's a little more um, sculptural and not, not vessel-based, not as much vessel-based. So that'll be a, another great guest artist to have. And we're also, this spring, doing, uh, doing some work with the artists from the Rockwell. Uh, there's an artist named Crystal Gregory who will be doing an installation at the Rockwell, and she'll come over here and do a little bit of work uh, with our team as well. So lots of fun things happening at the museum throughout the spring. Lots of reasons to come back and watch, watch fantastic artists working in glass. Just uh, experiencing the diversity of what's possible with this material, with the vision of different artists, I think is one of the, one of the highlights of living in Corning. All right, now Jeff's going to start to work that in a little bit uh, using that steel top table to start working some of the relief out of the surface of this piece. Oh, we've got a screen hanging up out there. I didn't even see that.
right now that's, that gold leaf is really evident on the surface there. Um, but it's nice, once, once the, the vessel gets blown up, it becomes a whole lot more subtle. And it just creates a little bit of visual interest in that. It's not overpowering at all once this piece gets uh, expanded, gathered over and expanded a little bit. I almost forgot, I do think we have some images that we can show of some of these objects when they're finished with Kathy's cold working on them. Um, up in the booth, is there any chance that we can switch over to the, to the, the images just for a little bit? I've got my clicker here. Or Helen, is that something that we, we do down here? I don't know. Okay. All right, so now they're going to be starting to apply the new red dots. So Helen Tegler here has heated that bar of color. She's using a, a, a bar of color. So this is a densely colored glass. We actually purchased this glass. Um, it's made by a company in Germany. We melt clear glass in our furnace. We also have another little furnace over here um, that has this turquoise blue in it. So we can gather two different colors of glass here, um, but if we want to use any other colors, we actually have to apply it. Ben made one of these the other day with that turquoise blue, and uh, I think it was a, a little bit soft, the turquoise. Yeah. So the, the turquoise patches that he put in there um, are really soft. It became a little bit thinner there. It was a little bit ornery to blow out, so decided to use some of the red, which is most likely a stiffer color this evening. to drop in there. Yeah, so up there in the booth, how about how about we get those images on? Is that gonna work? Can you give me a thumbs up or not? Not yet? Hey, there we go. Oh, look at this. I think this is Otto. This is Otto the, the miniature schnauzer. What, what artist presentation is complete without an image of their pet? Uh, this is Kathy. Uh, so this is Ben's wife uh, in her element um, at a glass cutting lathe. So a lot of the work that Ben has made, and they've worked this way collaboratively for, for years and years, uh, Kathy then will take into their cold shop and spend hours and hours grinding away layers of glass um, to create patterns and color. There's Ben uh, at his second job out putting a roof on something. I think every glassmaker is familiar with that. And I, I'm, I'm speaking for Ben now because he said he wanted to focus on his glassmaking, but this is Ben's other passion, and that's out uh, riding a mountain bike. Um, ben lives in Sydney and uh, spends a lot of his free time out, out on the mountain bike. Gold, but I'll, I'll get to that. That's a good question. So this is the Canberra Glassworks. Ben, this is where you make most of your work. Yep. Yeah, this, so the, when he's, once a month, he said he'll head to the Canberra uh, Glassworks. It's a beautiful public access studio. Uh, they do all kinds of teaching, all kinds of production and great things there. Uh, they rent, he can rent shop time there and make his work. It's a nice gallery show of Ben's work. So not only has Ben influenced heavily by uh, Italian techniques, by Italian glassmakers like Lino Italia Pietra, I think you can also see influence in it the Italian glassworking style of the 50s and 60s in a lot of this work. Uh, here's a, these are great examples, though, of, of taking forms that, are, that might be traditional Italian forms and then doing that cold working on the surface and you know, really getting some unique um, unique motion happening there. I know at the end of this presentation, oh, there's one from the vault. <laughs> Art school days, yep. And there's Kathy again, a work maybe, maybe a couple years ago. I remember this image when I uh, when I signed up for Ben and Kathy's class in 1996, uh, 
I remember seeing images like this and just being blown away by that combination of, of virtuosic glass making with really an interesting contemporary patterns on the surface. You know, Corning is a glass cutting town, right? We're, we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of glass making coming to Corning next year. 150 years ago, Market Street was full of glass cutters, full of shops where they would cut and engrave glass. And this is really a contemporary spin using techniques similar to that glass cutting. Um, I know this place has played a big role in Ben's uh, uh, education in glass. This is Pilchuck Glass School out, out in Washington State. Um, a school founded in part by Dale Chihuly, um, one of the first places that Lino Taliapietra, I think the first place that Lino Taliapietra came over to, to teach. And Ben was, was part of the first wave of students of Lino when he first came over in the late 80s and the early 90s. This is a very heavily carved vessel here. There's a lot of hours on the wheel creating that, um, that ridge that runs around this piece, really giving it a beautiful motion. Oh, here we go. Here we're getting to some of Ben's more current work. You can see uh, the piece there on the right side of the screen that has the cane work in it and then some of the, the cold working accentuating the, the motion of that cane work. There's a few more. All right, there's a few more. All right, Ben and Kathy. Too bad Kathy can't be with us. Summer 2019, back here in Corning? All right, excellent. You heard it here first. Ben and Kathy back at it in a few summers here at the museum. Excellent. So let's get back to the to the live camera, please. Thanks. And there you can see just adding some of those final little nibs of of new red glass. OK, so there was a, an online question. We've added gold leaf and uh, the gold leaf on the surface of this stays gold. Like you can see it actually looks like gold. It glitters like gold. Um, has anyone heard of gold ruby glass? Red glass, right? We say it here all the time. You can actually make red glass using gold. So why doesn't the area around that gold leaf, why doesn't it turn red? Um, I wish I had a better answer for that question. Um, my speculation is, is that it doesn't get hot enough and it's not, it doesn't really have the right atmosphere. So when you're melting colors, when you're making colors in glass, you start from something called batch, which is all the raw materials, and you mix the metallic compounds in with that, and you melt it at a high temperature, and if you use cobalt, for example, it becomes a beautiful blue. I know that, the, that melting ruby red glass is, is one of the more difficult colors to melt. We can easily melt copper blue glass here, or iron green, or cobalt blue. Um, I'm, I've never melted ruby red glass myself because I know it takes a, a special process with a special atmosphere within the furnace. Um, but I'm, I, I think in this case, the simple answer is it doesn't get hot enough. Um, if you use a copper foil on the surface of the glass and you overheat it, you can actually get sort of that blue, that coppery blue color around the foil. I've, I've done that before. Um, but I've never seen the same thing happen with, with gold leaf. And also with the silver leaf, um, sometimes it gets a little bit of a yellow look. Silvers can create a yellow colored glass. Um, but I've never seen the same thing happen with, with, with gold leaf. And that's something that we might have to ask one of our 
our scientist or Dr. Cook to explain a little bit more, to look into, into a little bit more. Uh, but for the most part, if you apply foils, you're working at a lower temperature, I think the foil would be more likely to burn out and go away than it would be to form a color, that red color in the glass. All right, so Ben's back on the pipe reheating this in the furnace. Now that he has the cane pattern applied, he has the, those red dots applied, it's going to be a matter of working that texture out, right? So it's going to be repeated heating, marvering, blocking, using the paper, however he prefers to work some of the texture out of the surface of this glass. Really getting it hot. This is, this is really when you have to um, make sure, you, <laughs> make sure you, you're, you're ready for the workout because that big gob of glass is really hot there. Even when you gather, it's not as ornery to handle it as it is when you reheat it right like this because when you gather, you really let the core cool down and you have that structural core to gather on top of. When you're reheating to do something like this, you can see that blowpipe is glowing almost as orange as the glass is. So it's really hot all the way down to the core. And the torque on the pipe is tremendous. It's a lot of weight, and it takes a lot of power to keep that, that pipe turning. So you notice earlier, Ben was letting Jeff take the heats, right? Jeff was turning the pipe, reheating it. But when it comes to a critical time like this, because Jeff took those earlier heats, Ben's fresh. He can grab the pipe, get it really hot, and really get a lot done. Working that heat into it, using the marver to get that nice and smooth. That's been a, a big transformation just in this last heat from taking that big heat, using the marver to get the job done there. <coughs> we'll let Lee get right up on that. And you can see. Can you see on the, the screen there, there's still a little bit of relief in there between, between those dots? It's going to take a little bit more work. If we can go back to the handheld camera for a second, please. There's just a little bit of relief in there still. There we go. So another couple of heats to work that out. He's not just hopping right back in there either. He's, he's letting it cool down and letting that core stiffen up a little bit again. Don't, don't just get right back in the heat. Be patient, let it, let it settle down a little bit in the core, and then get a good heat on the surface. He's even gonna help that along using, using this hand torch. Especially back near the pipe, right? Because that's the part that's hardest to get hottest right now, back near the pipe. It's the last thing in the furnace, the first thing out. Uh, so getting rid of the relief near the blowpipe is uh, the hardest part right now. It's easier to get rid of the relief down near the tip of the bubble. Oh, we're... I was just going to check in with our live stream audience, but we might be down with our live stream right now. Any other questions? How's everybody doing up there in the cheap seats? All right. <laughs> okay. No, no, music is great. Anybody been in the auditorium? Anybody dancing yet? Good. 
Good. Hey, how are you? All right, getting another good heat in there. Again, we're going to be working on smoothing out that surface. So this is still going to take a, another gather of glass on the surface. So again, he's just working on smoothing that out. Just gave the bubble a little check in there. Blew through the pipe one more time to get that bubble rounded out. How's it coming there, Ben? Good. Yeah? I made a little decision on the fly to uh, take off those four dots. Oh, yeah? I think I might like to change the four around. The nice. It's also massive, and I don't want to get it. <laughs> nice. So Ben was just saying, uh, artist's prerogative. Uh, he's made a, a design decision on the fly. He added the four, the four bits of red glass near the bottom, uh, and he's decided that he doesn't really like that. He wants the cane to come down to the bottom so, so that the cane pattern will be all the way down to the bottom of the vessel. Otherwise, he'd have, have those four red dots all the way down here. So th they're going to lop those off. So George is getting a nice heat on that. George Kennard, our master gaffer here in the shop, getting that nice and warm for us. And then using the paper, he'll work that together a little bit. Look at that. Doesn't that remind you of a, a, a potter throwing clay on the wheel? Just squeezing in there with his thumb and forefinger, bringing that bottom together a little bit so he can get his jacks around there and create a constriction and work that off. For anybody who's just come in, our artist this evening is Ben Edels. Uh, ben is with us all the way from Sydney, Australia. Ben's from Sydney and uh, lives and works there, um, but certainly coming to the United States has played a big role in his career as a glass artist. Um, a lot of Australian glass artists come over here to take classes, here to Corning, to Pilchuck and other places. A lot of artists from Australia um, sell and exhibit work in the United States. The, obviously, the, the market for art glass in the United States is um, maybe a little bit bigger than in Australia, so there's some more opportunities with galleries. I know Ben has had shows in galleries all over the United States. And so he's spent a lot of time over here, and it's great to have him back. Um, been a few years since he's been here in Corning, and it's great to have him back here. Um, he taught a class last week and uh, was a guest artist here in the amphitheater this week, uh, finishing up with 2300 tonight, and back on a plane heading for Sydney tomorrow. I have a great team helping out tonight with Helen Tegler, Chris Rochelle, Jeff Mack, George turning the pipe there. It's a great thing about living in Corning, you know, it's a small town, right, but 
lots of really talented glass makers all around. How many, how many people around here are actual glass makers? How many of you blow glass? Raise your hands. I know you guys up there. Raise your hand if you're a glass maker. Anybody? Excellent. Lots of glass makers around town here, so it's always fun uh, to have a, a deep pool of talent to pull from to, to do all kinds of fun projects here and over at the studio. It really makes this place a, a special, special place to be. Lots of fun things going on. The glass maker's corner up there, yep. I didn't know that. On this one? I think it's on that Jack Oh my gosh. Did you guys know that Dwayne Dopsy of the Zydeco Hellraisers is the Jimi Hendrix of the accordion, according to Rolling Stone? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And Ben Edel's here. He's the he's the Australian Jimi Hendrix of glass blowing. <laughs> I don't know, Ben. If you had to pick a, a a rock god to describe your style, would it be Jimi Hendrix? That's that's a tough question. Yeah. We were discussing, of course, all all things Australian the other the other night, and. Uh, Ben informed us that the lead singer of Men at Work was, in fact, Scottish. So, yeah. We're back live? All right. Welcome back, live stream. Sorry about that. Robbie Williams. Wow. So, Ben is the Robbie Williams of glass making. <laughs> Yeah, I think Robbie Williams is the the Ben Edels of of, of of music. You don't know who Robbie Williams is? I'm not going to sing one of his songs for everybody. Anyway, yeah, sorry about the live stream there. Um, we're glad to be back. You basically missed marvering. So if you're watching on the live stream, you missed a lot of heating and marvering, right? Everyone here can vouch for that, right? They just missed marvering for the for the last ten minutes. And now we're back to getting ready to make the final gather. This is where the fun starts. All of the colors applied. We have that core bubble shape set up. Um, heading back in for a final gather, and then the final push to form this piece into a lovely vessel, sculptural vessel. So that. What you're looking at right there will become the very bottom of this uh, vessel when we're done. So it looks like he's got a beautiful terminal point down there. And you can get a good look at that, that cane pattern. Um, the cane pattern in this used a really dense white colored glass uh, called Duro White. So you can make really fine lines and it still stays beautifully defined. So nice strong white colors, stripes going through there. All right. Somebody just wants a recap of what happened. But yeah, the recap for everybody online, once again, basically what we did for the last 10 minutes or so was heat this up and marver it out, smooth it out. Um, ben has applied the color. Uh, you first applied the cane pattern, then dropped dots of uh, a color called new red in there. So the red colored, the dots on there, which kind of look livery brown right now, are, are going to be a beautiful bright red when this piece is cooled down tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, maybe. 
Uh, so he applied the color, spent some time getting this, the relief out of the surface, getting any, any sort of uh, crevices out of the surface there so that when, we, when he dips on that, when he gathers more clear glass on there, it won't trap any air bubbles. All right, so maybe a little bit more of that. He must have spotted some areas up there that still have some creases that still need to be worked out. Just a little texture. Yeah, just a, a little texture. It's always back there up on the top of the piece where it's hard to get heat in from the furnace. It's hard to get it on the marver. Uh, so it's really important right now that, to take the time to get rid of that. that. That hot hand torch helps out a lot to drive some of the heat back in the top there. And now maybe another go with the block uh, to get that smoothed out. A little bit of stretch coming back. He's going to work the top part of that with the paper a little bit. Looking good. It is a great shot. You can even see some of the gold leaf going through the piece there. It's nice depth too. The, the, the cane that he applied there, the cane was around the surface of a clear core, so there's actually a couple layers of cane in that stripe, in that uh, bit that he applied to the surface there. It gives a nice depth, a lot going on. All right, so now I think we're good with the texture. Now it's just a matter of setting this up for the final gather. What's up? Okay, so just getting this set up for the last gather. Sounds like the Zydeco might have just went on their break. Zydeco Hellraisers. It's not something Ben can do. He's not going to set this down and come back to it. We're going to work right through. <coughs> so here we go, into the furnace, into that 1,000-pound pool of molten glass there. Push that bubble down in there, turn it around a couple of times. Get a nice, even coat of molten glass on the surface. Not as easy as it sounds. You really got to take care in the way that you spool that glass around there. He's going to give it a little strip here. He's just going to let a little bit of the skin drip off there. This gather wasn't really about achieving a whole lot more material or a whole lot more volume. It's more about just putting a skin on there, and getting that even heat enveloping that color setup that he's worked so hard to achieve. So
It's going to let some of that heat drive down into the core and then head over and use that block a little bit. We're probably up to a 14 block now, I think somebody asked online. Looks like it went great. I don't see any little air bubbles trapped in there. He was, again, careful to get all that texture out of the surface. Now it's about getting that heat set up to be able to inflate this and to get it to inflate the way you want it. It's not just a matter of getting it hot and blowing through the pipe. You have to heat it so that it's heated all the way to the core, so that it's heated evenly. Um, get heat all the way up to the pipe, and then start to work the shape. When you have a variable or random color pattern like this, it makes it a little bit more difficult to blow out evenly, and it makes it a little bit more essential to take care in this step now to even out that temperature. So again, back into the block. Yeah. It's a great, a great question online. How, do, how long does it take for, to get a feel for gathering and blowing out the glass? And uh, I always answer that, answer that question this way. If you've been blowing glass more than five years or less than 10 years, you, you think you have it figured out. If you've been blowing glass more than 10 years, you realize that you don't know anything yet. <laughs> so it takes a, it takes a while to, to know what you don't know. <laughs> and the longer th the longer you blow glass, the more the more you learn that really gathering is is where it all happens. Making a nice even gather, setting it upright, and uh, and that's where really where you need to be focusing your practice and your work to get better at this. It's how you set up this bubble, how you gather. All right. Yes. Yep, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I always have to go back to the beginning. I said in the beginning that uh, the work down here in front it was all made by Ben here in the shop in the last, well, since Monday. Yep, so Ben's been working hard uh, and has made a lot of beautiful work in here. It's been a real treat for us uh, to watch, watch Ben work and to see him produce these amazing objects. It's a great thing about glass making. You know, we're gonna we're gonna sit here two hours tonight and watch him make this piece, which might seem like a long time, but over the span of a couple of days, you can wind up with a pretty nice body of work if it, you know each piece takes two hours, maybe three hours if it takes a long time. Of course, in that goes a lot of a lot of the prep time. Um, ben has spent hours and hours pulling cane to make the stripes that go into the piece. Uh, we don't just buy the stripes; you have to get a chunk of color, stretch it out, uh, and, and then he picked that up and made this compound cane uh, that he applied to the surface of this. So this object is taking two hours to, to just apply the color and, and inflate it and get the form, um, but there are a couple hours of work that have gone into setting up the color. But yeah, Ben's made a lot of beautiful work this week. We told Ben that we're gonna uh, package this up and ship it to him in Australia, but I think it looks really nice in here, so I hope he, I hope he didn't pay too much attention to what he made. <coughs> so right now there's a discrepancy. There's a little bit of a a little bit of 
too much heat near the tip of the bubble, not quite enough heat near the top. So you can see Helen and, and Ben working together. Helen was using compressed air. Ben was using a torch. So Ben is heating the neck of this. Helen was cooling the tip. Uh, the tip of the bubble, first thing in, last thing out of the furnace, so it tends to get too hot. The neck, again, is a little bit harder to keep the heat in. And so using compressed air, using a torch there, uh, they were able to set up a little bit of extra heat in the neck because that's really the part that Ben's going to be working on right now. He wants to get that neck blown out a little bit more. And uh, he still has to put a neckline in here, right? We still have to cut that jack line in there to separate this vessel from the blowpipe eventually. All right, everybody working together. George turning, Jeff inflating, Ben's turning and shaping, Helen's shielding. This is glass making at its best, like watching all these people working in concert. Uh, Chris is setting up the punty already, so that's ready when this piece is ready for the transfer. And again, there with the torch up on the neck. All right, now they're setting that jack line, uh, creating the cut line off of the end of the pipe there. This will become the, the top of the vessel. Yes. How much do each of these pieces go for? How much would they cost? Um, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. That's not a question that we really like to answer. Um, as a, as a museum, um, we tend not to put a value on something. Um, it's not just a cop-out. It's really what I've been told to say. Um, <laughs> ben, I think if you, if you talk to Ben, he could probably give you an idea of what, what these would retail for in a gallery. Um, it's probably not something that um, anyone would casually purchase this evening, I would say, if you just felt like having a, a pretty vase to put in your house. It's probably one of those kind of purchases that you'd have to think about. And there's good reason for that, of course. You know, ben, Ben's been doing this over, I think, nearly 30 years or more now. And uh, he's among the best in the world. He really is, I can say that. Uh, he's got a fantastic technique, uh, beautiful aesthetic. And he just creates absolutely lovely work. <laughs> I just wanted to show you guys, too, um, in this pan right here, if you can see it, uh, is the red that's applied to this piece. So you might have thought I was kidding you when I said it's red dots. But this is actually the red that... Ben has used in this piece. I pulled this out as one of the scraps off of some of that, some of the color that was applied tonight. So colors, especially reds, are pretty hard to, to get a true take of when they're hot. All right, again, working together. Yeah. Ben's watching that expand. Jeff's blowing through the pipe. Ben's using the pad of newspaper to keep the bottom a little bit thicker. Kind of blowing this up round. If you've seen us do a demo here before, you've seen us blow around bubble, right? Glass, like a soap bubble, it kind of likes to be round when you blow it up. He's making a taller form, uh, so pretty soon gravity will come into play where we take that round form, get it hot, let it stretch out a little bit, let it elongate. 
Of course, we have that great view in the furnace here. Watching that heat up. You know, Ben's on the pipe. He's going to get that nice and warm. A lot of torque happening there. A lot of, lot of uh, force turning that pipe. Remember, every time you turn that pipe, you're basically picking up the weight of that object. So it's dropping as you're, as you're turning the pipe. It's like he's keeping the neck out a little bit. He doesn't want the neck to stretch. He wants the body of this to stretch a little bit more. Allowing well, gravity to pull that down. And back up. So by term determining how far this goes into the furnace, you're kind of setting up where this shoulder breaks, right? Like, so if you, if you heat it higher up, you're going to get more of a drop, more of a bottle shape. If you heat it lower down, it'll come more to a tapered point at the bottom. Um, so that, that's kind of what's going on right now as he's heating that. Depending on how far he has it in that furnace, where the burner is. <laughs> All right, nice big heat there. I can't wait to see this one when it's cold, to see that red really pop there. All right, backing up with the turn there, George again. You know, I've been watching a lot of the Olympics, so I really feel like we should do, you know, that personal interest story right now, right? Where we break to Ben riding his bicycle through a meadow in Australia. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely an avid mountain biker. Yep, yep. Sure. Yep. Is it on display anywhere in the place? Uh, nope. They no, they finished it. Um, so whenever we have a guest artist, um, he, this gentleman was asking about the, the last piece we made for 2300. Actually, what's made belongs to them. Okay. And so they took it with them. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, you so they'd probably have it here for us to see it. They, they had it here. They hadn't finished it then. They were around for a couple of days, but, you know, that was, yeah. <laughs> but since then, we've sent it on down there. Yeah, sorry to say, did that one make it online? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the one of the rough things about glass making. We love like when we finish a piece to be able to pass it around or have everybody come right up and take a look at it, but you always have to wait um, when we make an object, just on our daily demos, you have to wait until the next day. Usually when we have a guest artist here, they're making pieces that have to anneal longer than that. So it may be even 3 days after the piece is made before you can see it because it it's thicker or bigger and it has to anneal longer. Uh, and that was certainly the case of last last month's 2300. The piece took a while to anneal, and then they had a little bit of cold work to do on it. And Robin and Julia then uh, took it back with them down to Norfolk, uh, where they're from. Yes. Yeah, when this cools, the, the dots will be that bright red like is on the marble there, and I think the stripes are just white, just uh, the duro, duro white stripes with a little bit of gold leaf on the surface. Okay. 
Did you find a picture? No, it's even better the video of it. All right. Oh, is that the video? Yeah, right out of nowhere. I missed I missed last month's 2300. I heard it was quite a nail biter. <laughs> a lot of fun to watch. Again, next month we we have our St. Paddy's Day 2300. We have the Red Hot Chili Piper, Pipers coming back. So you can't go wrong with 2300, right? We have accordion this month, bagpipes next month. <laughs> Good stuff. Always glass, always great glass making. Next month we have a home team uh, doing the demo. Uh, Megan Matthew, Dane Jack are going to be uh, gaffing the piece next month. So we're really excited for the, the St. Paddy's Day 2300. All right, now working on getting that bottom set. And Ben says we're ready for a punny. Now, he really doesn't want to perfectly flatten the bottom on this piece. A lot of times when you make the, the bottom flat on the, on the blowpipe, it gets a little bit wider than you really want it to be. And so on an object like this, you may not even bother flattening it too much because Ben knows that the final flattening will happen on a on a diamond flat lap. So just so you can get a nice, a nice small point on the bottom that this sits on, you get a little bit of elevation. You can see this one isn't even setting on the bench. We have it setting in this donut um, because that bottom still needs to be cold worked. And really, the object is just to get a nice little small patch of contact there, so that the vase has a little bit of lift off of the table. It doesn't sit too heavy. Yeah. There's a, a question about that has to do with style, with personal preference. <laughs> so um, online they're asking why didn't you use the paper marver? Uh, ben used two paddles, and I would guess probably because it's not really not really going for just a perfect cylinder. Uh, there's a little bit of contour along this whole vessel, and with those paddles, uh, it might be easier to to nail that contour. Yeah. You could do that too. We, that's another thing we were talking about earlier. Uh, Jeff and Ben and I were talking about glassmakers on Murano and how um, there's not really a Venetian style or a style from Murano because if you watch five different glassmakers from Murano, you'll see f five different ways of approaching the glassmaking process. Uh, so there's not one perfect way of making a goblet or one perfect way of blowing glass, but Everybody kind of develops their own style, and they, they do what works for them, even in a place as steeped in history and tradition as Murano. All right, so they've got, got the punty attached. Chris Rochelle has presented, brought over the punty and presented it. All right, so they're getting ready. A little bit of water up in the neck, up on the rail, a little tap. Chris takes it, look good. Keeping it interesting. All right. A little, 
a little, little juicy back there still. That's okay. No harm, no foul. <laughs> That's all right. You know, we really want a nice, a nice attachment on the bottom there. It's, um, we were using the air to set that up a little bit. Ben said, go easy on the air. You know, you don't want any little cracks to develop down there. And uh, we still have a nice, uh, still on center, have a nice, still have a nice crease in the, mar in the punny attachment there to get this off. You know, it's just, it's a show. We have a lot of people in the audience. We want to make sure everybody's awake. <laughs> nice recovery. Yeah, you know, we were talking about making mistakes in the glass shop, and, and uh, somebody here at the museum said, oh, it'd be fun to, to maybe sometimes see people screw up more um, because it gets exciting, right? But really, glass making is a process of continually messing up and, and fixing your mistakes. And you, hopefully you do that before anybody notices anything wrong, anything but anyone else but yourself, you know. Because um, there are always little things that, that are going a little bit differently than you hoped they would, and you're always working on correcting them. I think anybody who works any kind of glass, if it's on a torch or on a, on a, out of the furnace, can relate to that. Nothing ever goes perfectly, and it's always a matter of assessing your mistakes and f fixing them, straightening things back out, giving it another heat, and marching forward. Oh, nice. Oh, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> thanks for watching. Um, how much does a piece weigh? Um, you know, this, this probably weighs 10 or 12 pounds. It's about the same scale. Yeah, yeah, so it's a similar scale. This one might be a little bit heavier. Uh, um, but still, you know, it's not 40 pounds. Um, but as you can see, you know, it's, uh, it's ornery. It's always moving. It's really hot. It's on the end of a long pole, uh, and that all makes it a little bit harder to handle than if you're just picking it up cold. Same heat, Chris said. We're getting some heat back in the top. Um, Ben's using the paper, some graphite tools. Maybe, maybe even inflate it a little bit more um, with the Sofietta. Helen has a Sofietta in her hand. Um, you can actually plug the top of this, blow through the end of that tube, and inflate the glass even though it, it isn't on the blowpipe anymore. So this, this requires even more coordination between Chris doing the reheat Ben keeping it straight, getting that contour, and Helen blowing through the end of the pipe. All right. Brought that right out. Another little puff. Getting some volume back up there in the top. All right, so it sounds like the Zydeco is coming back. Yeah, it was. All right, back to the marble this time. Nice. It's really great to have a team you can trust. Um, we haven't worked with Ben a lot, but 
you know, you guys have watched Chris and George they blow glass for all kinds of folks. And uh, when you're making something like this, it's nice to step away a little bit to, to get a, a view of the form, how it's evolving, how it's developing, um, to make sure you don't have any funny kinks or flat spots in the contour of that piece. So now it's time to work up towards the top and working on getting the, the rim of this piece set up just how he wants it. It's a great, nice, tight shot there. You can really see that beautiful cane pattern. I have to say, I haven't watched Ben finish one of the tops of these. So I don't know. Ben, do you use, are you going to trim that? Or are you going to jack it in and knock her off? Yeah, jack. Yep, jack it in and bonk it off. So we'll be stretching this out and then creating a cut line in there and, and cracking off the top to get that final nice little opening there. All right, getting in there with the pair of tweezers, giving that a little bit of a stretch. And of course, that's not going to stay. Now it's a matter of getting in there with the jacks, starting to constrict that back down, create a tight line in there. It'll give them something to pull on to stretch out a neck and then tap that off. I can't wait to see these colors when we're done. See that beautiful bright red come back out. As always, we'll be posting a picture uh, online of this object when it's done and out of the furnace. If you're in town here, you can stop back by over the weekend. We'll probably have it out, um, probably have it out on Saturday and Sunday for people to have a look at. Oh boy. What's that? Yeah, so d just so everybody knows, uh, even though Ben is thousands of miles away from home, um, Kathy, his wife, is watching online right now and, and giving advice. She said this piece might look a little bit heavy. But I, I think it's, oh, it's important to have a partner uh, when you're making glass to, you know, help you strive to be the best. And uh, I went through some of the slides earlier of the collaborative work that Ben and Kathy have done over the years. Ben, um, if, you, if you come in here recently, um, it might be new news to you that Ben, uh, this work here isn't finished, that Ben's wife Kathy actually takes, takes this glass takes it into a cold shop, uses an engraving machine, a glass cutting machine, uh, to create textures and patterns in the surface, which really enhance the form and the color patterning. Uh, so these pieces, even when they're off the punny, won't be done just yet. Your dad's name is Tom, by any chance? All right. So so we have, we have Ben's wife watching from Australia, and uh, 
my dad just chimed in on the live stream from from uh, Northwestern Ohio. So, don't you love modern technology? <laughs> yeah, it's it's great to have family watching from far. Here with us tonight in the hottest place, hottest place in town. Listening to some great Zydeco music, watching some great glass blowing. So even if you can't be here in Corning with us, it's great to know we have some, some friends and family watching all over the world. All right, so Ben worked on stretching the top of that out. Um, just uses jacks to create a crease in there, tap that little floweret off the top, and just a little bit more touch up on the opening of this uh, to get it to the point where it's ready to box, ready to go into the annealer. And then ready when it gets back to Australia to, to head into the cold shop for the finishing work on the bottom. And maybe a little texture on the surface. Nice little subtle touch up there on the rim. Now we're working down to the point where this needs to come off at the end of the blowpipe, go into an oven. Because this doesn't have a flat bottom, we're not going to be able to sit it in the oven. It's actually going to lie on its side. So getting the temperature right is of extreme importance, making sure that it goes in there cool enough that it won't slump hot enough that it won't crack. It really has to be in a very fine temperature range to be able to lay this in there on its side and not pick up any texture, texture from the floor or the annealer or the wool that we lay it on, not to collapse or become oblong at all. So right now it's just a matter of winding the temperature down and just getting everything just so to get it off at the end of that punty and into the box. Man, it is family night at the museum live stream. Helen, Helen got a uh, got a, a hello from her sister, so that's great. Love to see people tuning in online. Also, if you didn't catch all of this online, we do put these up on YouTube uh, in a week or so, maybe a little bit longer. This will be up on YouTube, so you can catch the whole demo. Uh, if you missed parts of it tonight. Certainly invite everybody to come and see us here live. Uh, next month, 2300, is a celebration of St. Patty's Day with some great glass making, some great music from the Red Hot Chili Pipers. A little bit of final work on the volume and the, and the contour of this piece. Getting a little bit of shoulder puffed up in there, looking nice.
<laughs> Good stuff. All right, really working on getting the nice shoulder in there. It's the bubbles following the heat. I don't know if you can see that subtle change there, um, but Ben worked with the torch to get some heat up there in the top with a little puff. It really rose up and got nice and round up there in the shoulder. It's a good shot going in. I, I like the on the the camera there to see how the how that wrap pulled up towards the top. We have a couple of patches of clear up there. They have a lot of fun stuff going on with the cane, and then that red color pulled up towards the top. It's really nice how that all resolved up there near the opening. Man, I hope people are moving the auditorium. If you're not moving to this music, I don't know. This is good stuff. All right, getting down to the fine details up there on the opening. <laughs> All right, so being mindful, uh, if you were here with us, on that transfer, being mindful of the transfer there, Ben's going to take a little bit of extra of attention uh, and get a little bit more of a cut in on the punny before we go to bonk this off. So we're going to use the hot torch and cut in a little bit. When, the, when we had that punny transfer there, it did crease back a little bit. So we're going to get a little bit of a cut in on that. That's all right. Makes it fun for Chris putting the, the heat of the hot torch in on the punny. Gets a little squirmy down there again. Just a little bit. All right, last flash. Jeff's getting on the suit to be able to put this away, putting on his gloves. Ben's getting in there with those long shears. Just a little bit of insurance down there. Making sure after all this work that that comes off the punny nice. Still moving, no rush here. Again, we wanna make sure we get that into the oven. Not too hot, not too cold, just right.
All right, everybody, here we go. A tap and a turn. Pops right off. Wait till it's in the box. And we've got it standing, everybody. Ben Eddles. A long distance kick. Thank you to Kathy Elliott, Ben's partner in crime. Helping out George Kennard, Chris Rochelle, Jeff Mack, Helen Tegler, 